Bill Gates, thank you very much for joining us on BBC Breakfast. I just wonder if I could first ask you, how important is it now to have a global response? Well, I'd say it's critical because the tools that are going to reduce deaths, the, the drugs, you know, that's a global thing uh, to get those out. And the thing that will get us back to the world that we had before coronavirus is the vaccine and getting that out to all 7 billion people. And so the efforts to test those, to build the factories, uh, to understand, you know, is it safe and ready to go? Uh, that's a global problem. Uh, and, you know, so I, I'm glad, you know, that uh, people are coming together to find where is the best work and combine that. You know, the factory will be in a different country than the science is in. Uh, this is the whole whole world working on probably the most urgent tool that's ever been needed. Can I ask you to just reflect a little more on the the way that world leaders thus far have responded to the crisis? Well, there's the period uh, when I and other health experts uh, were saying that this is the greatest uh, potential downfall the world faced. Uh, you know, going back quite a ways uh, with a speech in 2015 and a New England Journal of Medicine article about the specific thing. So, you know, we definitely will look back and wish we had invested more uh, uh, so that we could quickly have all the diagnostics, drugs, and vaccines. Uh, so, you know, we underinvested, uh, which was my goal, uh, was, was to get that to happen. We did do CEPI. Uh, which uh, helped with some of the vaccine platforms, but not even 5% of what we could have done. Then there's the period where the virus shows up in those first few months. You know, what were the tests prepared? You know, did countries think through getting their ICU and ventilator capacity up? There'll be time for those postmortems. You know, uh, very few countries are going to get an A grade for uh, what uh, that scrambling looked like. And now here we are. You know, we, we didn't simulate this, we didn't practice. So both the health policies and economic policies, we find ourselves in uncharted territory. I know one of the messages that you're, you're very keen to put out there is, is about that there should be more international cooperation. Can you try and give us a sense of what that you think should look like in practice? Well, the Coronavirus is going through waves. The first wave was uh, very much China. And now there's a wave that almost all of the rich countries are experiencing uh, very challenging epidemics. Uh, hopefully by early summer, if the right type of isolation policies and testing policies uh, have been implemented, a lot of the countries will be beyond the peak and looking at opening back up. Sadly, the developing countries who as yet don't have a huge number of cases are likely to have the worst of it because their ability to isolate the capacity of their health system is far less uh, than in, in the rich countries. And so the global cooperation is to help those countries uh, and by helping them make sure the disease isn't spreading back uh, to the other countries and then to supercharge the therapeutics and vaccine work, which will involve expertise from all over the globe. Do you think there's a, a very real risk then as uh, leaders of developed countries try and deal with the situation, the crisis in their own countries, that not enough thought will go to those places you mentioned before that at this stage possibly uh, haven't been thought about enough? Well, certainly, you know, say we get a therapeutic that's partially effective, it'll be in short supply. You know, what will the al al allocation be? Likewise for the vaccine. I do think that because the peak in the developing countries is coming later than in the rich countries, you know, countries like, uh, you know, European countries, China, the U.S., we can take some of the, you know, mask and ventilator and other things that have been ramped up and make sure that we keep making those things, but then uh, they'll be needed. We'll have to shift those into developing countries. And we're seeing you know, China stepping up a bit in that way already. 
When you talk about a therapeutic, you're talking about a, a vaccine, I'm assuming. Is that right? No, I use therapeutic for uh, treating somebody who's ill. So that would be like, uh, you know, maybe, although the evidence is very, very weak, hydroxychloroquine, uh, remdesivir. There's antivirals, antibodies, all sorts of things. The foundation created the therapeutics accelerator that's looking literally at thousands of things uh, that you would give, that you treat somebody. Uh, that is only after you get sick. And of course, the vaccine is a protective to prevent you from getting sick. Now, can I ask you in relation to the vaccine, I, I know that you've donated a, a sum of money in relation to that. Just talk me through how, what do you think are the key elements around developing a successful vaccine? Is it money? Is it political mm -hmm. will? What, what do you think are the key elements to that? Well, we definitely need to fund the research and the manufacturing and the distribution. The distribution piece for developing countries will be Gavi, where the UK has always been super generous on that. The research will need to fund about 10, the 10 most promising constructs, because we won't know in advance which one will prove to be safe and effective. And being effective for older people whose immune system is weak is a huge challenge. If you really amp up the vaccine to do that, then you can run into safety issues. So we're gonna to have to take something that usually takes five or six years and get it done in 18 months. Uh, there are There is an approach called an RNA vaccine that people like Moderna, CureVac, and several others have that looks quite promising, but we can't count on that. So we'll back you know, four or five of those and four or five uh, companies using a more conventional approach which unfortunately the schedule for that would probably not be uh, as quick as if this RNA platform that you know we've been funding uh, directly and through CEPI over the last decade. You'll be aware a lot of people uh, in the UK are asking what is a very simple and straightforward question, which is when will there be a vaccine? What do, how do you see that? Well, it's a perfect question because we want to get back to the life we had before coronavirus. And, you know, people are seeing the, the economic destruction, destruction, the psychological stress. Uh, you know, this is such an unprecedented, uh, very tough thing to deal with. The people like myself and Tony Fauci are saying 18 months. If everything went perfectly, we could do slightly better than that. But there will be a trade-off. We'll have less safety testing than we typically would have. And so governments will have to decide, you know, do they indemnify the companies and really say, let's, let's go out with this uh, when it's, we just don't have the time to do what we normally do. So 18 months is, is about what we'd expect. We're doing everything we can. You know, we'll write checks for those factories faster than governments can and they'll come along. It definitely shouldn't be money limited. It should, should be, you know, all the best constructs, full speed ahead, uh, science limited. As I understand it then from what you're saying is that it may be that there needs to be some compromise in some of the, the safety measures that may, would normally be expected to create a vaccine because time is so crucial. Well, of course, if you, if you want to wait and see if a side effect shows up two years later, uh, that takes two years. So, uh, whenever you're acting quickly, like during the HIV crisis, they created a, a quick way of getting drug approval. There is a trade-off there. Uh, in that case, it worked super, super well. And here, you know, we have, we will, I think, be able to get some safety indications, but it, this is a public good. And so, you know, those trade-offs, the government's working on a cooperative basis will be involved in the decision to say, hey, the regulator says go ahead, even though you haven't taken the normal time period. Do you think uh, world leaders now are listening in a way they didn't out of necessity, bearing in mind, and I know you referenced it before, 2015 you gave one of those uh, TED Talks, and if people go back and listen to it now, uh, it was extraordinarily close to what is happening now. You were talking about the real risk of a pandemic uh, across the world. Uh, did you feel like you were listened to then? No. The investments that could have been done 
so that diagnostics would have been essentially immediately available, drugs in less than half the time, the vaccine in less than half the time. Uh, most of those investments were not made. Now, CEPI is the exception to that, but that's about 5% of what could have been done. Uh, now we're scrambling and it's taking us much longer to get these pieces together, even though scientists are doing heroic work. So, you know, unlike the defense budget that prepares us for wars, where we simulate the problem and we make sure we're good at it, this risk, which I viewed as even greater uh, than the risk of war, there was very, very little preparation. Very few of these uh, germ games where you try out and say, okay, how do you build up the ICU capacity? You know, can you make ventilators? How do you prioritize the diagnostics? That we're just figuring out as we go. Do you think that, was that, do you think, a partly a financial decision that, they, that it wasn't deemed to be worth investing that money in something that maybe other people didn't see as clearly as you? Well, it's got to be governments because uh, you, there's no private sector incentive uh, for something that's uncertain like this. And even when it happens, you you know, you have to charge mostly a break-even price for things that are helping out with a, a global crisis like this. So, uh, you know, people still saw war as something to fund in the less than 10% of that that would have been needed for this. You know, people just didn't uh, organize their government to have that that function. I do think now, because this has been so dramatic, uh, you know, we weren't ready for this pandemic, but I do think we will be ready for the next pandemic. And using uh, the new tools of science, that's very, very doable. Well, it was that really was my next question. I mean, given what you said in 2015, and, and you were very clear, people didn't listen. Do you, are you optimistic? that now, and obviously we need to get out of the immediate situation, but there will be a different mindset around the, the fears around viruses and pandemics. Yeah, your speed of reaction is so crucial here because it grows exponentially. You know, if you're there two months earlier, which some countries jumped on this faster than others, you know, they really were checking to see if there was community spread. They got the diagnostics capacity up quickly. But, uh, you know, we should be able to have diagnostics within a month. Uh, we should have be able to have therapeutics in more like four months and a vaccine less than a year if we're on standby with the right factories and the right science. And we should have rehearsed how we deal with all these shortages, with working together. Uh, so a really good system uh, for seeing this early and making sure we jump on it before the curve gets to a meaningful part of the population, that is achievable. I know you, uh, you reflected for a moment on this earlier on in the interview, and it is inevitable that here in the UK, we ask our politicians questions about the way they've reacted. And to a degree, it's inevitable that those, that thought process will be something that happens in the future that we look back on. I mean, c can you sort of talk us through what you see from, from what's happened so far? Well, the, a big missing piece is that, you know, funding the research for these type of vaccines, uh, you know, actually our foundation is the biggest funder of vaccines for infectious disease. Uh, you know, there could have been more. CEPI is the one uh, thing that, that did happen there. And, uh, you know, now the next phase is once we get the cases way down, how much can we open up? And that now there is an opportunity for governments to see what others are doing, to see which ones do run into a rebound of the disease and uh, really share these deep understandings you know, like do young, are young people part of the infection chain? Uh, you know, so I do think we'll, we will deal with this opening up phase uh, in a more collaborative, uh, data-driven way than that the first scramble uh, where sadly, you know, many uh, governments were, were slow to react.